Viewers and subscribers, welcome back to Beating the Press Podcast. I am your host, Rafa. Now, coming up in today's episode, we're going to be reviewing that big game, that monster game, which took place midweek. Manchester City running away winners over league leaders Arsenal. We'll also have for you previews of those European battles taking place in the EPL as well. We have Liverpool taking on Spurs, and we also have Manchester United hosting Aston Villa. Now, joining me this evening to review and preview these matches, we have returning to the podcast, Leon. Welcome, viewers and subscribers. Yes, Leon, welcome. I, I see we had some mouth-watering clashes midweek to, to, to feast our eyes on, and we're going to kick things off by looking at that massive game. Manchester City running away winners over Arsenal. Some had dubbed it the EPL final. <laughs> what, what was your take on that result? Manchester City running away indeed. Um, I think I predicted um 3-1. <laughs> well, I wasn't much off. I think there's only one way this tie could have gone based on form and based on quality. And we saw that. Arsenal was really hoping, really in this match, their fans are really hoping for a result. But over the years, Man City never really loses a must-win battle, especially in the Etihad. So I think Arsenal probably tried to give a good account of themselves. Many key players losing farm in this key part of season. And, Ar- and Man City just, Man City as usual, just <laughs> firing away. <laughs> yes, Leon, but I mean, the scoreline 4-1... Did, did that really reflect the game? Was there such a golf in class where City ran out 4-1 winners? Was that I the mean, case where they, was Arsenal totally outplayed? I think the scoreline even flattered Arsenal, to be honest, because Ramsdale was making a lot of saves and I, I, didn't know, I don't know what happened to Haaland in this match. I think he had mercy on Arsenal because it was, if it was the typical Ar- Haaland, I think Arsenal could have picked up like six or seven I think they were the, they were probably outclassed because they play similar systems somewhat, but we know that right. Pep is a little bit different than Arteta. And when when it comes on to City playing teams that have similar approaches, it's just b- bigger quality f- with with City. Yeah, it it was another case of master versus apprentice, uh, and we see the master really putting on a master class in terms of. Uh, the pressing game and that possession game and that passing game. I mean, they, they totally cut Arsenal to shreds. You know, you know when Arsenal tried building, you know they were constantly under that heavy high press system, and we saw where Man City nicked the ball a few times. Unlike no. when Arsenal tried to press Man City, Haaland was always that out ball. You know, when under pressure, they could just kick it up top, and Haaland had the strength to pretty much hold off those defenders. I think that was a key key um, point you made there when it comes down to tactics. I mean, I think Arsenal probably had most of the position early on, but they, it was useless position. It was mainly across the, their back four. Right, right. I think I think City did something different. Normally, City would, be, would have a high press. I think they pressed in like a mid-block. They allowed mm. Arsenal back four to have the um, the ball. And when, when City had the ball, I, I think, I saw an interview with De Bruyne said it was a little they, Pep gave them a little different in, information for this match. He said normally Pep would allow them to play with two eights, but in this match it was more of two sixes to gain the extra control and <laughs> and they always had Holland as an option. Right. Out ball. That's it. And on quite a few occasions he was used. In fact, uh that's how one of the goals came. Where uh he the ball was pumped up to him, he held it up and then knocked it off to that Kevin De Bruyne. I believe it was the first goal, if memory served me right, when mm-hmm. Kevin De Bruyne ran through and and had that incredible shot there for that goal. You know, yes, I, I think your your character is, it was the first goal, and I think you even in this match you can see like the difference in Haaland um versus the Haaland in the first couple part of the season. I've been right. noticing that in the recent matches is. His control and his first touch is a, is a lot better. And I think a lot of people said, um, including me, saying that Alvarez probably fit this Man City team better. But over the, the past few weeks, I see where Haaland is really 
fixed fit in it. I think his first touch is way better now, and I think he's linking <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, ha- Haaland has to be the first pick on the on, on that team sheet for Pep. I mean, there's no going around it. He's an incredible striker. In fact, I would go as far as to say the best the EPL has ever seen. I have been watching the EPL for a long time now, and I have not seen in the EPL a more prolific striker than Haaland. And I mean, to think of it, this is only his first season. You know, the season when one should be adapting to the rigor, the so-called rigors of the EPL. But I mean, he, he has not hit the ground running. He has hit the ground sprinting. I mean, um, <laughs> you could say Haaland uh, has been adapting to the Premier League, but... Based on his talent. Well, I, I would not want adapted. to see him when he, he is fully adapted. If this is how he is adapting, what happens when he is fully adapted? What? We are looking at, what, 50 goal in the league? I mean, it's a scary, <laughs> scary thought for the opposition. But I think Alan's game is coming. The little that he has to improve on, I think he's improving on it. And as you said, the best striker in Premier League history, the stats says it. I think he, he beat uh, Mo Salah. Of course, yes, definitely. I mean, it. the criticism is that he doesn't have much other than scoring. But why do you need anything else if you're getting a striker who is going to give you consistent goal scoring every game? He doesn't need to do anything else. And fascinating enough, in this game, what, he had two assists and a goal? So I think <laughs> I think last match last match too I think he had a couple of assists and I a lot of people don't remember, don't um, forget that Haaland is just twenty one so his incomplete game is gonna become more complete the older he gets and oh it just... yes it's scary scary to think of it you know but but Leon what of Arsenal I mean Arsenal came in this game league leaders and looking pretty much to solidify themselves at the top of the table. And of course, you know, the media has been dubbing, dubbing this one the EPL final because now with City running out winners, City, even though not leading the league currently, they do have those games in hand. And the anticipation is that Man City will win those games and eventually surpass Arsenal at the top of the table. But tactically, for me, I found that Arteta tactics weren't the usual tactics that have brought him success throughout the season. I believe he showed too much respect to this Man City team and as a result was unable to impose the Arsenal way of playing on Man City. To me, I, I would have gone head-to-head with Pep and may, may the best team win. But so, uh, Arsenal think... seemed to take a cautious approach for this one and eventually they just got ripped apart. You don't think they... They they went head to head. I think I think they went went head to head as possible. I think that Man City just outclassed them. I just think it's a it's a different beast because really I didn't see much change to be honest to how Arsenal plays. I think they tried to play the position game. I mean, you can interject if you can. Well, for sure, I it was the same eleven as we are accustomed to. But I thought the approach it was a more cautious approach. It wasn't that long-busting, aggressive, taking the game to the opponent type of approach. It was a more cautious, you know, it's, it's almost as if they, they were anticipating whenever play breaks down, then they would have to be in that transitional setup. You know, think... it, it wasn't that fluid arsenal, that fluid movement that we are used to. You know, a number of their key players were off the boil. I mean, Saka, for example, oh, you know, think... was... No, we're to the guard. I mean, you right. could call you could call almost all of their team. I think the difference you you notice notice in Arsenal is it's it's not much. However, the game plan I think is just a loss of confidence because yeah, you it, know it's a mental it, mental because mental. you know when when everything is going for you, some of the passes that you normally would try, you you wouldn't if you're lack that of confidence is it, when, it, when you, confidence is flowing. And I think that was just. Um, that was just the reason with Arsenal because even when playing playing around the back, now Arsenal would have attempt more line breaking pass more right, fouls. Right, right. Didn't have really yeah, the confidence. Exactly. To try. You know, it was more uh, sideways passing rather than vertical passing, and you know that build up play was so slow that Man City could get back into position and pretty much close on the spaces and then apply that that press, which the they did successfully to a large extent. Yeah, Arsenal, uh, Man City was just shuffling around based on which side Arsenal put. And, and as you said, a lot of their key players, even Martinelli, when Martinelli got subbed, uh, 
I didn't remember he was playing. I think he got like <laughs> one or two touches. And you know that uh, even though Arsenal plays a lot centrally, you know that their wide players are, are key. Right. Those are the key attackers, you know. They they are the ones who pull defenders out of position and allow those forward runs by Odegaard and, you know, those goal-bound runs by the likes of Jesus, you yeah, know. I think, yeah, and I think um, even, I think, from the based on the first half, you could see where this game was going. I think they City went two 0 up right, right at the half. Right. Half. Yes. Yes. That was it. That Stones goal that came under VR VAR scrutiny. That's it. And I think I thought Ars, um, Arteta would change it up a little because knowing how important the match is and they're already losing, I thought he would introduce Tussard a little bit quicker. Mm. Right. Like so, a substitution because as we said, Martinelli was. Basically yeah, that, that's that what game. I'm saying. It was a cautious approach. That's what I'm saying. It, it was too <laughs> cautious. It, 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 I am disappointed because of the way Arsenal approached the game. I'm not disappointed because of the result. It's just the approach which surprised me. Inexperience you know? and a lack of confidence. That's ah, just... That is it. That is <laughs> it. That is it. And, and then... you know, it is what it is. And right now, they are under the cush. For one, they can't drop any more points. We, you know, And right now, Man City is in the driver's seat. So, it, it, you know, if they are not strong mentally, it could very well be curtains in the next game if they are not careful. Because we know Pep is definitely not going to be dropping any points. I believe Man City plays next against Fulham. Fulham, which is on a poor run and without their talismatic striker, Mitrovic. So, for sure, that should be an easy routine win there for Man City. So, Arsenal definitely has to come all guns blazing in their next game. But it is what it is. We move, Leon. We move. <laughs> we move. It was a fantastic game. Uh, and a good result for the neutrals. I'm sure the Arsenal fans are feeling disappointed at this stage. But it they, is they what knew. it is. Knew what was coming, they tried, you know, to, to have a little bit of chest out, but <laughs> ah, ah, but anyhow, Leon, the weekend matches they are still coming quick and fast, and we have two big games, two games of European implications coming up. Let's take turn our attention now to look at Manchester United versus Aston Villa. We see Aston Villa. As I mentioned in previous podcasts, Aston Villa has been a team which has remained under the radar. They have been silently successful under Emery. And they are right up there, neck and neck, fighting for you know their European place. They take on Manchester United on the weekend. Quickly, on what's your take on these two teams entering into this game? We saw Manu today drawing after leading 2-0. Over Spurs, which was battered by Newcastle. What's going on in the Manchester United camp? I mean, I think for us, Manchester United, I think after being battered, Spurs was always, always going to turn up. And I watched the game today. And I, I mean, I, I saw more fight with Spurs today. But as, I, as I'm saying about Manchester United, we've played almost every game this season. And even our some of our starting players are not up to quality, so we're really on fumes right now. And you could see that in the second half. I think Manchester United just ran out of gas. The um, sloppy passes. I think Bruno was not fit today. I think they forced him to play. Mm. And with our two cent main centre backs are injured, and it's just they're not trying to finish out the season. As but as, but, yeah. <laughs> but all right. That being said, Dolian. Can Manchester United finish in the top four? That's the big question. Yeah, I think it it, it should be possible. I think based on the position we are at now and even with injuries, that's not really an excuse to just mm. throw away the rest of the season. And, right. And we have like, I think right now we're playing one game out per week now. So the, the players should be able to have a little bit rest. And I think we should make it. There's no excuse to make it right now. And Aston Villa on the other, on the other hand is... It's going to be a hard team to beat. Yes, that's what I was just thinking. That, I mean, Aston Villa right now is the farm team in the league. I mean, yes, they are playing away from home, which, you know, they have had mixed results away from home. But at Villa Park, Villa Park has been a fortress. I believe they have now gone four, four or five games on the bounce at Villa Park without even conceding a goal. So this game coming up is away at Old Trafford, but I don't believe it's going to be a walk in the park. In fact, 
my gut instincts is telling me look out for the upset in this one. It would not be a surprise for me if Aston Villa went to Old Trafford and came away with all three points. What say you? I mean, I think the difference um, with Old Trafford, I think Old Trafford this season has really been a fortress for Manchester United. Mm. The stat says that or like for the top nine positions in the league, I think Man, Man United haven't taken a point away from home from them. So to go to Spurs and draw today wasn't really shocking because we have been poor on the road versus top nine opposition. But on the other hand, when it comes down to our home form, we have beaten a lot of big giants mm. at home. We've beaten Arsenal, Liverpool, Barcelona. <laughs> so I think it will be I think it will be more ah. more a better performance. This, better performance this at home. But I, I, I'm not counting out Aston Villa. You know, Emery have the tactics and the know-how to bring this team to Old Trafford. You know, key figures such as Oli Watkins, Buendia. We even saw, saw Tyrone Mings, one of the essential defenders, uh, popping up with a goal in that 1-0 win in, in, their, in their recently concluded game. So confidence is definitely flowing through that Aston Villa team and they have a top manager. So tactically, uh, Emery should be able to formulate the requisite tactics to counter whatever Manchester United brings. And again, I'm going to reinforce the point that based on what I've been seeing, it would not surprise me one bit if this one is an upset and it pretty much break that top four challenge wide open because right now these teams are not separated by much both in terms of points and also position in the table yeah, i mean you're, you're correct i mean based on form as a if i was to put on my aston villa hat here i mean why wouldn't you go to ultra fred and and try to come away with all three points i mean manchester united has been fluctuating and you have been on the farm and you have Good, a, a great manager also. So I don't think um, Manche- the, the, ma- the manager battle will be that far apart. So it's just what yes. Aston Villa can show on the day and how Manchester United respond. Correct. And Manchester United leads Aston Villa by six points. So if Aston Villa wants to get a result here, that gap would be cut by three. So it's all to play for in this one in terms of finishing in the top four. And if not the top four, then pushing for one of those European positions, whether it be the Europa League or the Europa Conference League. So it's all to play for come match day. That's right. That's right. I think that should be the aim for Aston Villa. I know that probably before you, you and I, Emery, they wouldn't have set their aims that far. But as we know, things change in the season. So should your expectations. So I, just, I think you and I, Emery, should be aiming for a Europe, Europa League spot at least. Yeah, because right now he has the team playing the Emery style. He now has a set starting 11, which is known and trusted, you know. Uh, even though it has a mixture of youth and experience, we saw the old head, the former Manchester United uh, winger, uh, Ashley Young, really playing well in the defensive back line there. And we have Moreno on the left back side. Really coming into his own after being transferred in the January window. A transfer that really went under the radar. And we're, I mean, Aston Villa is already reaping the rewards of that, you know, that transfer. So that 11 is clicking. They have gelled. They are showing good chemistry, good movement up front. Uh, Of course, Oli Watkins always has a goal in the locker. So definitely. And as you mentioned, with Manchester United main centre-back pairing out injured, uh, that defense line may very well come under pressure. We see, we saw where what Spurs today breached it twice, and of yeah, course yeah. could have had more. Yeah, I think. So, yeah, you know, it it's not to the faint of heart, or it's not beyond the realm of thinking that Aston Villa could, get, could something. get something out of this one if Manchester United is not careful. Yeah, that that's true. I mean, Emery is a great coach. I think, as you said, most of their starting level are. Pick catching form at the right time, and Marino was a wonderful left back. I think he, 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 he I think his old club was Real Betis. Mm. I think a lot of people don't um watch outside of <laughs> Barcelona and Real Madrid, if from the Spanish league, so they wouldn't know about <laughs> Marino. Right, right. But I think, and Emery was coming from Villarreal, so he would have had a, a lot of time to know which. Yeah, so I think um Aston Villa 
wonderful team on form. And I think, as you said, with Manchester United, I think we're playing Luke Shaw and Lindelof at the center back so position, you, right? So you know they have to um like have ad adaptability and time playing together. So right, right. It's not it's not far from impossible to think that Aston Villa would come and get something from Old Trafford, but I think Manchester United should. should so what? Should. So what's your predicted score for this one? And my predicted score is I'm two one Manchester United. I think Aston Villa will score, but I think Manchester United will have enough to fend off this. I'm, I'm gonna go in the opposite direction. I'm gonna go two one for Aston Villa in this one. I just feel based on what I'm seeing on the field, based on the farm, and as you said, with Manchester with Manchester United dealing with a few injuries and a few team selection, uh, you know, changes. I'm feeling that. Aston Villa may very well. This is a prime. It, it, you know, it doesn't come any better than this for Aston Villa. It, it, it's really set up right now for them to really go to Old Trafford and get something. Just based on the way they're playing. And yeah. of course, the the injury situation and team selection situation that it's facing Manchester United. This is a prime opportunity for them to take advantage of what is taking place there and come away with all three points. So for me, I'm going to go 2-1. Yeah, that's Aston Villa. We'll see. As a man in Manchester United fan, I, I believe we'll get something from this game. Yes, it's, it will definitely be a fascinating weekend of action, and I'm definitely looking forward to this one. But we move, and we move to Anfield. <laughs> Liverpool, Liverpool hosting Spurs. Talk to us, Leon. How do you see this one? Of course, Liverpool coming off a, a, a 2-1 victory over West Ham. And we saw today Spurs coming coming from behind, coming from 2 0 down, showing some mental fortitude in front of their home fans and pegging Manchester United back to level this one and leave with a point. They drew 2 2 in that one. So we have Liverpool coming off a win and we have Spurs coming off a draw. This one taking place at Anfield, which has been somewhat of a fortress. For Liverpool. Talk to us, Leon. How do you see this one panning out? And how do you see these two teams entering into this game? Um, for Liverpool, I think Liverpool is on is on some form of run from the other day. I think they've been winning. Uh, I think they win the last two matches. I'm not sure. Um, yes, I, think I believe so. I, yeah, I know so. they they beat West Ham two one, and before that, who was it? Uh, not... yeah, that that game is eluding me currently, but. Yeah, they, they've been showing some form. They've picked up a few points here or there, which has elevated them in the table. Still, to me, a bit of inconsistency here or there. Uh, not all the victories are that convincing. I believe the game before this was a fairly convincing one, I believe. I think they ran off, what, four no. one winners? Was it? Not them first? Yes, it was... yes. Or was it 3-2? I would have to go and check back. But yeah, that one was our victory at home against Nottingham Forest. And then they went away and, and won versus West Ham as well. So yeah, I, think, I think Liverpool is catching some form. I think their lineup is becoming pretty consistent. I think Klopp found a formula and I think he's working. He's stay, sticking with it. I think Gakpo is, has adapted or... He's, ad he's adapting well towards the league and I think he's getting on the score sheet regularly. And I think um, Salah score one and two match here and there. Versus Spurs, I think right now, I think Spurs, um, I, I would say a new manager bounce. Mm. It's just really their mentality that they came out with um, in the second half against Manchester United. And I think their fans played a massive part of that because their fans are, were cheering every tackle. So I think it would be yes. very different when it comes down to and feel and I think I think Liverpool has the edge in this. I think Spurs probably can get something out of it with right. their new form of enthusiasm mm. <laughs> that they played with today. But I I see Liverpool winning this one. Yeah, Liverpool is actually on a, a five game unbeaten run, you know, ever since they drew nil nil against Chelsea. And then of course that two two draw with Arsenal and they have no one three on the bunks. Uh six one versus Leeds. Mm -hmm. Uh three two over Nottingham Forest, and of course, just recently that two one victory over West Ham. So they are unbeaten in five and have won three in a row. Probably the first time for this season, if memory serves me correct. So they should have some confidence, especially in front of their home crowd. Always. And I am anticipating that 
with the fragility that Spurs have displayed somewhat away from home, ah, uh, my I'm feeling Liverpool may very well have too much for the Spurs team in this moment. But again, I am really not getting carried away because Liverpool has been so inconsistent all season. It's been hot and cold all season. So while my instincts are telling me they should definitely have the edge entering into this game, I am still reluctant to, to classify this one as a banker. Uh, <laughs> really, uh, anything can happen, you know. And as you say, you know, our uh, Mason, Ryan Mason, one of their former players, turned coach for a few years now. I believe his career was, was cut short due to a horrific injury, which ruled him out or uh, ended right. his career prematurely as a youngster. He's now taking over the reins at Spurs. And we all know once that happens in the EPL, usually there's a little resurgence with the team that has experience and new manager. So I don't know if this 2-2 two -two draw over with Manchester United is a result of that resurgence under Ryan Mason, the new manager at Spurs. So I am cautiously optimistic about this one in terms of uh, this one taking place at Anfield. So while I do expect and anticipate that Liverpool will win this one, yeah. I am still not holding my breath on it because anything can happen. The ball is round and these two teams are definitely pushing for European position as well. So it's all to play for in this game. All to both, play for. Both teams, I wouldn't even say the hot and cold thing for Liverpool. I think both teams, <laughs> Spurs mostly cold, Liverpool hot and cold. But I think these two games, the Manchester United game and the Liverpool game, Yes. I Perfect timing for Spurs with a new manager bounce because, as I said, I watched the game today. Right. Game three at, three at the back formation. Right. I think right. the only difference in Spurs play this time around it was like the energy, the effort, the effort and, and that... the energy, and of course they're playing with a familiar formation as well. In yes, comparison and... to what took place there at the Newcastle game, we also saw the wing back Pero popping up with a goal as well. So. Yeah, I think Spurs can definitely take some positives from this game against Manchester United and bring that positive vibes to Anfield. You know, of course, Klopp seems to have now settled on a 11. You know, this team which has gone on this three-game run is unchanged, you know. So the midfield seems to have found a bit of lift, a bit of form, a bit of cohesiveness where you have Fabinho Henderson and the young gunner uh, Curtis. And of course, up front, you have the ever-present Salah, Gagpo, full of energy, full of running. And of course, Jata is now seem to be somewhat up to speed as he is coming off a long-term injury. So we see the, the, you know, the front tree firing, the midfield and... tree finding some farm, and the back four is still susceptible at times, but it seems like the team as an overall unit is it's finding some momentum. So... Trent, of the... course, now playing a, what, an inverted role there, uh, operating as a midfield, which seemed to be giving the team greater possession of the ball. So that position or that position of the ball is almost as if by attacking, you're also defending. So you starve the opposition of the ball, so you have less defending to do, and that seemed to be working. But, of course, they're still susceptible to the odd goal here or there. Yeah, but I think um, momentum I think that is there. That was a key um, tactical change from Klopp. I think many teams knew what Liverpool would do and how to how to stifle them. When right with, with this new trend moving into midfield, it adds <laughs> extra creativity. It adds an extra dimension. So teams now have to think again and come with a secondary plan in in order to stop this Liverpool team. Yes, and that has always been my criticism of Klopp when compared to Guardiola. Guardiola tactics and methodologies are constantly evolving. However, Klopp seems to have been somewhat set in his ways or is a bit slower to evolve his tactics and his methods. And well, to me, that is probably what caught up with Liverpool this season, where teams figured them out and they became stale. While Pep is constantly changing his tactics. We are always expecting something out of the bag. And yeah. sometimes... He has gone too far at times. I think with that Pep has been just... a criticism, but I think he has reined it in somewhat and the changes are now more subtle rather yeah. than full force, so to speak. But I'm happy to see that Klopp has somewhat evolved his tactics and that move, as you say, from Trent now playing almost as a 
extra midfielder when in attack. It seemed to be working for this Liverpool team and yep. has added a bit more balance and assistance to the middle, which, as I said, has come under tremendous criticism this season. That's true. I think, yeah, with the trend in midfield, I just think it, it adds dimension, as you said. I think we know of trend, range, range of passion, and I think in the midfield, he, he makes a lot of use of that. And I think the blueprint that teams had to come and play against Liverpool, I think they just have to tear that up now and have to try analyze this Liverpool team because even with Gakpo and Jota coming back, right. I think it's a very dynamic and a lethal dynamic front three. Definitely, where positions are constantly interchanging. Sometimes Gakpo goes deep, searching, and then Jota and Salah runs behind him, and then as true ball is slipped through, and or I it think goes that... wide and it's squared, and you know Jota is very good in the ear, so. Since lately, he has scored a few headed goals and have missed a few headed opportunities as well. So he could definitely improve on on his finishing there or sharpen up his finishing as well. Yeah, but the chances critic- are being created, which is the greatest thing. I think another key um tactical change from Liverpool. I think early in the season, I think Salah was mainly staying wide left, like he was mm. literally sitting on that byline um, right, to, help, right. to help supply for um, Nunes, and I think. With this new system, I don't think he necessarily has to stay out there all the time. I think a he, bit, he's roaming a bit more now, making some he, inside runs. No, Salah closer to the box is way yes. more lethal yes. than trying to get an assist. And of course, so. once he goes in, he takes the defender with him as well, which also leaves space on the flank, which Henderson and Curtis seem to be popping up in that space and crossing from that half space between the midfield and the defense as well. So, yeah, that's an astute analysis there, Leon. But yeah, it yeah. will be interesting to see, though, the clash of formations. We know Spurs is definitely going to come with a back three. Yeah. And, of course, Liverpool is not going to change their 4-3-3. Three, three. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic in terms of how these two formations clash and who can get the better of each other tactically. Or who will be forced to make any tactical adjustments. So for me, that's what I am especially going to be paying attention to. How these two formations actually counter each other. You know, back three versus a back four. Especially, it it um, should definitely be interesting. Yeah, I think Spurs wing back, so they can see a lot of joy, especially down train side, especially with him leaving that role because I noticed it against Man United. They're always high and wide, those right. wing backs. And it takes a while before the defender to get to come out to come out and mark them, and I, I think they're looking for the switches, especially. And I think for Trent, um, with Trent um, moving from that right back to occupy in the middle, I think it could be a key area for um, Spurs to um, attack. Really, yes, and Sp- Liverpool definitely have to be weary of the Spurs attacker. I mean, the world class Keen. And, of course, Son coming into form and they're, they are that dynamic duo. They are constantly linking up. You know, either it's Son to Kane or Kane to Son. And we see Kane now uh, taking up sometimes a more deeper role and releasing those balls to the wide players, the likes of a Son or a Kulosevsky. So Liverpool definitely have to be on their P's and Q's and be aware of, what, the, the second leading goal scorer in the league behind Haaland, who, who is Kane. So... Spurs definitely has the ability to put this Liverpool defence under tremendous test. So it's going to be a very interesting game. But in terms of your predicted score, Leon, what say you? I'm I'm going with um a 2-1 for Liverpool. I think Liverpool attack has been formidable since late. And I think Spurs will, Spurs will, co- will score because I don't think... I think Liverpool defence has, has mistakes in them. But I yes. think Liverpool will have enough, too much for Spurs on this one. I'm going to go with a Liverpool win for this one as well. I'm going to back Liverpool for this win, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm going to trust my instincts. I feel, based on the farm of Liverpool, playing at home, knowing what's on the line, knowing what's at stake, uh, a bit more confidence in the team now, I'm going to go with a 3-1 for Liverpool. As you said, definitely, this team do have some cracks in the defence which I feel with the world-class player such as Kane should be able to at least exploit a goal. But I think Liverpool will, will have too much in front of this Anfield crowd for Spurs. Yeah, I but, think it's a yeah, good prediction. Yeah, that, that's how I see, see this one panning out. 
But what's your final word, Leon? We are quickly running out of time. What's your final word on this weekend of action coming up? I think um this weekend should be an interesting weekend. I think especially the top four battle. I think the the title race is not really done, but we should see how Arsenal bounce back. And I'm just looking for a good week of football. Yes, myself, looking at a good week of football indeed. And I am looking to see how the narratives play out. How will City react after taking this massive step forward? How will Arsenal bounce back after taking this giant leap backwards? And of course, how will the European position play out? Liverpool versus Spurs, Aston Villa versus Manchester United, and of course, the relegation battle. It is so tight in the basement. So it's definitely a week of various narratives taking shape. And we'll definitely be here to watch the games and, of course, be back to review these games. But there you have it, viewers and subscribers. I just want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for continuing to share, to subscribe, and, of course, to comment. i just like to extend my thanks to Leon for passing through again and sharing his thoughts and his opinions. But until next time, this is Rafa signing off.